Yo, 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 Mike Check 1 2, Mike Check 1 2. Welcome back to the Agatino Zinga Show. It's a perfect day today. Sun is shining. I'm feeling great. Just come back from the gym, got a good little pump on, feeling nice and refreshed. And today we're going to celebrate something, man. We've got some good news today. So it's a short podcast, it's very concise, but we've got some good news to celebrate. I could not, could not go without celebrating this good news today. So let's get some music going. Uh. Come on, YouTube, don't take me down, man. Don't take me down, YouTube, man. Don't take me down. Let me play this shit. Uh, it's a celebration, y'all. Huh, 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 huh. And in case you're wondering, I've got some good news to share with you guys. Finally, for those of us that live in London, right, who have been without a 24-hour club, who've been wondering where should we go to go get fucked up for 24 hours, I've got an answer for you. Okay, let's stop this shit. Hey, welcome back to the Agostino Zingo Show episode number 89 with me, your host Agostino. And today's a very, very, very special day in um, the history of London nightlife, all right? Of... Um, it's a very special day in the history of those who like to go out and dance to electronic music in dark, dingy nightclubs surrounded by people who might be fucking, who might be taking drugs, who might be uh, talking about a project they want to do because they're on, they're on so much MDMA, they think they're going to do all the plans in the world. If you're a fan of those things, right, if you're a fan of standing in the queue for two hours to see a DJ play for half an hour and paying 20 quid to get in, if you're a fan of attempting to stay out after their... F- after the time of 4 a.m. right in London and you can't find anywhere to go, I have some good news for you. Some welcome news. Some news that will blow the socks off your feet. But guessing by the weather, you probably aren't wearing socks. Right? You nasty, nasty boy or girl out there. huh? You nasty boy or girl. I know the sun's out, right? And it's beaming on our backs and I'm kind of sweating at the moment and I'm wearing these ridiculous Hollywood glasses. But you should. You should put a pair of socks on. I'm probably not going to put a pair of socks on, but who cares about me, right? Who cares about me? Who cares about what I do? But anyway, back on subject, good news has spread over the interwebs the other day. Resident advisor, let it be known. Let it be known that a new 24-hour club has opened in London. How amazing is that? After everything I've been speaking about with the Hackney Council thing, um, the new licensing policy that's come into effect where new bars are going to be forced to close uh, Monday to Friday at 11 p.m. and new bar- and on the weekends at 12 a.m. Um, existing bars will still have whatever license they have um, agreed already, but for new bars, it's going to kind of stifle any new nightclub popping up anywhere, right? And I kind of got on my um, high horse and started bemoaning people that live in Hackney and for kind of stopping this licensing thing. And I kind of bought into the wheel of Hackney propaganda. But after reading into the subject a little bit more and kind of getting myself educated on it, I saw there was two sides to the story, right? There were those people who lived in buildings that are not equipped to handle um, a stretch of clubs on their road, right? The noise kind of leaks in. They don't really have a problem with the clubs, but they just don't want the noise to leak in. And then on top of that, all the litter and all the rubbish that gets left behind. And if you're if you're if you're honest, right, and you're watching this and you're or you're listening to this and you're a fan of going out and having a good time. If you've been to London Fields, which is a popular park here in London, um, I'm sure you have them all around the world where people kind of, young people sort of like congregate in the summer or people in general, but usually mostly hipsters. If you've ever been to London Fields, Victoria Park and these kind of places um, during the summer, you'd know that we're, we're, we're a bunch of messy shits, right? We don't clean up after ourselves. There's cans and people's takeaway shits left all over the grass, like everywhere, covered. And so much so that they have to employ a special, not they have to employ, but they have to get the cleanest of like you know they're desert they're kind of like situated in and around the park so they can come around and periodically keep cleaning things and you know they, they they go out of their way to make sure people don't fuck up but even after that they still fuck up i remember someone taking a picture actually of a mound of fucking disgusting litter left behind and other countries are not immune from it as well berlin has the same problem i, f- I remember seeing a a, vid- a link from a website that berlin had this issue where people were leaving loads of cigarette butts in the parks everywhere like just on the floor and they got loads of volunteers to come and clean it up and it was literally like a mountain like a pyramid of cigarette butts all over the floor so i say all this to say um as much as it's, as much as it might annoy you the hackney council has kind of gone you know back in time and sort of like reneged on a whole 24 hour um London nightlife economy thing that Sadiq Khan 
kind of you know is um championing with a 24-hour tube you have to understand too you know coming out of your house and seeing loads of vomit over the floor and cracked gl- and smashed glass and people getting off of each other in the corner or taking drugs and shit it's fucking annoying you know what i mean all the time it's super super annoying especially when you live in a building where you get to hear everything and i've mentioned it before the flat that i live in has the same sort of problem even though it's built a, it, my my flat is built in the 2000s i think early 2000s whatever and we still have the issue with noise leaking in through the windows i say all this to say the solution that I thought would be good after kind of doing a bit of research and looking into it, because I'm I'm fucking I'm fucking putting myself forward as being the London nightmare. I wanna I wanna kind of you know help to craft and to um, act as the maybe the in between, the go between between you know the the hipsters on one side and the actual residents to kind of you know have a way of, of like ex- actual having some real dialogue and not you know having placards outside of town hall that only fight your case and don't understand the other side of the of the coin. So after doing some research and looking into it, I um, stumbled upon um, Amsterdam and how they've kind of gone about dealing with the nighttime economy. And as you, and I've not been to Amsterdam, but I can imagine the CD undercurrent nature of Amsterdam. They've had to put a lot of things in place in order to make sure it doesn't go over the top, right? Already you can go there and, you know, you can get your socks, you can get your rocks off and, you know, get a little tug, you know, visit a young lady or a young man or a young she-male or whatever you're like or whatever you're interested in, you can visit that. You can go and smoke weed and shit, take mushrooms and all that malarkey in cafes. You can go and have a good time. But they've also done a really clever thing with their bars and clubs. What they've done is that they selected 10 clubs, right? 10 clubs that are allowed to have a 24-hour license. But most of these clubs are dotted in and in um, just outside the city centre. So not not like in the main part of it where a lot of residents do live and they mix and mingle in there. So you kind of have to travel a little bit outside of the, um, outside the city to kind of, well, outside of the city centre in order to kind of get to the nightclub. And then what they've also done is that they've put the owners on the club owners to ensure that their patrons behave, right? And that their club is a... Is a um, is a what you call it how do you, how is a pillar of the community right it gives back to the local residents so you know some of the clubs they double up as uh, facilities for studios um, they, um recording studios um what you call it co-working spaces uh, meeting rooms cafes all that malarkey is mixed into it so that what happens is that the you know it's kind of like an agreement between the council or the local authorities and the club in order to say, look, we're going to give you a 24 hour license, but it's under, it's, it's under one strict condition. You've got to make sure that people behave and no one gets fucked up over here. And that's what, and that's kind of similar to what the bird kind of done. And I think we've got the same sort of thing happening in London, because as I mentioned before, resident advisors have announced that a new London club called fold has just been opened. So let's give that a clap. <laughs> Yay! Super happy. Uh, fold, a new 24 hour club has opened up in, um, in Canning Town, which is amazing, right? Because that's where I'm from originally. My parents still live there. Um, it's it's um I know where the area is. It's kind of in the area where um the DHL and Parcel Force collection points are. So whenever I order like shoes and stuff over eBay and whatever, when I was super into sneakers and Japanese clothing, um I'd get it. Most of the time I wouldn't be at home and I'd have to go pick it up at this like random um, warehouse place. So there's loads of warehouses there, printing shops. Um, I think there's an alloy place there too that makes alloys for wheels and shit. Loads of really random shit, but effectively no one lives there. So no one's going to be there on a the weekend. No one's going to get disturbed. No one's going to get pissed off. Um, everyone leaves at five on the dot. It's like, it's, it's amazing. And this is what I thought would be a great idea for London, right? Um, Especially because most boroughs have like every borough has a, their own kind of licensing law. Because I think London, Newham is weird too. Because I think I mentioned it previously. Newham is strange because I have a bar down the road that's open until half two, right? Um, and there's another couple of bars that open until four. There's one um, called O'Neill's that's open until two. We have a, I don't think they've kind of caught on to what's happening because we don't really have much many hipsters here. So the demand, so we haven't been stretched. Our resources haven't been stretched. They haven't, they haven't seen what it's like to have. I don't think Newham has seen a, a Dawson Saturday night, a, a Dawson or Shoreditch Friday Saturday night. They haven't seen it, so we haven't kind of kind of um, adjusted our laws uh, to kind of fit into it, which I'm happy with because that, that means fold can kind of slip in before the law changes. I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't touch wood, but effectively, I think this is a good idea um, to roll out um, citywide because Canning Town is quite far east, right? So it would be, a, I think it would be quite a good idea if you wanted to do this to kind of dot these 24-hour clubs like east, north, west and south, right? The furthest corners, maybe the south one would be like in Croydon or Bermondsey or Camberwell. And then maybe the north one could be like, we've, maybe you've got something like Simmons where like five miles or those kind of places are like Tottenham, Enfield and shit. And then maybe west could be, 
I don't know, somewhere like Ealing, even in a super west far, but you know what I mean? Like dot them as far as you can outside of the city centre and put them in areas where they're not ne- they're not like near to like built built up residential areas and that's it. That's fine. You've got you've got kind of points that people can go to where they can go and party for twenty four hours. Um, it's a it's a clear as day where you can go and do that and then tourists coming over can also plan their business a little bit more better because they know where they can go and rate for 24 hours um, as opposed to London where you kind of don't have any idea everywhere is quoting late no one wants to really say what time they're going to be open to because if they do say it it might discourage people who are going to come there later blah 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 and it's also nice to know that there's a nightclub you can go to and just stay out until the Sunday morning which is great anyway enough about me rambling this article is really good about the club called Fold um get up on here on screen read this guys for read this for you uh essentially it says east london's first uh part east london spots first party is set for saturday 18th of august anyway it continues a new 24-hour venue called fold is opening in east london this month uh, fold run by shapes collective sits above a print factory on an industrial property between canning town and star lane with a 24-hour license in hand and no footage policies in effect the space main feature is a 16 1600 600 sorry 600, 600 capacity dance floor and the second room is also due to open later this year fucking amazing right absolutely incredible i love how they've approached everything um the no photos policy is going to be great you know similar to kind of just follow follow the blueprint right um most successful people will tell you this or i've read most successful people say this like just follow what i did right don't don't follow what i say or whatever yeah do as i do not do as i say kind of thing because sometimes you know you can kind of contradict yourself but just follow the examples there's a blueprint out there people have made mistakes like after watching the studio 54 documentary i realized quite quickly that Bergheim and every other um club that came after that era has sort of learned from the studio 54 mistakes right you know, the idea that they were too strict on the on the door, the idea that it was too celebrity focused, the idea that there was lots of pictures of glamorous people inside and people outside couldn't get in. So it built this resentment that they couldn't get in there. Bloody blah, blah, blah. Everyone learned from those lessons and then kind of ev- little by little ev- um, evolved and refined their vision of what a club could be. And now we have kind of places like the Bergheim that are kind of the shining example of how a club should be run. There's some people out there that won't agree and still say, I never got in there. It's a piss take. But once you do get in there, you realize why they go out of their way to make sure they're so strict on the door. And little things like this. The fact that it's in Canning Town, which will require people to travel a little bit a little bit further in order to get somewhere, in order to get there, right? In order for the most part, there's not many many, many kind of um underground music enthusiasts living in Canning Town unless they've moved here recently for the most part. You know, it's not really a place where people want to go to live because, you know, it's on the Jubilee line, which is a bit shitty. It's a bit far out of everywhere to kind of travel from if you wanna party in in the main parts of East London. So it's a travel destination. It's in the middle of a warehouse space. Um, so you kind of have to be well behaved in that regard. And I'm, I'm hoping if they're strict on the door and have no no photos policy, it will kind of make people behave a little bit more better inside once they get inside a club, which is going to be an amazing thing to do overall. Um, and then the article continues and says, venue co-founder Lasha Georgiolania, Georgia Lanier, um, a.k.a. Voice Drone, says the 24-hour sessions will generally take place on Saturdays, while Friday night parties will go on until late and midweek events will run from 3 a.m., which is what you want, right? I'm not, I, I'm not, advi- I, I don't think we could, ha- as, as a city, we could handle um, real 24-hour nightlife like other, cl- other cities have. I don't think maybe we could handle it that in that regard. But I do think we should have some hotspots, north, east, south, west, right? Where you can go and you know, Monday to Thursday, you can party until 3. Uh, Fridays, you can party until 5. And Saturday to Sunday, you can party for 24 hours. We should have those places um, around because as I've seen with this um, video, and I might, I might show you guys later about the protests in Georgia, right? Um, that uh, you know, a very conservative society in Georgia, very Christian based, is kind of fighting against the LGBTQ and kind of you know the alternative scene that are running these um, underground club events because they say it's kind of glorifying or it's uh, it's glorifying drug use right? or it's promoting drug use. But that isn't that that's like a fact of life. People are gonna take drugs. People are gonna go and have a good time and drink alcohol and get fucked up, right? You know, the best bet to kind of um 
control that in some way, shape, or form is to provide them with with venues that they 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 can use that are safe and that are run by a really great company or a great group that can take care of their patrons. You know the idea that you can't stop the drugs, but you can maybe help them and have a place where they can party. That's great. You know that's not good facilities. It's in a good area. It's open too late, so they don't have to do their drugs within a four hour window. They can do it maybe at a longer stretch of time. All these things kind of help. You even see it with. Um, a few english festivals implementing um testing labs for drug um for drug use right there's no point um having sniffer dogs at the front gate because people are going to get stuff in regardless but you don't want episodes of like 18 year olds overdosing on shit ecstasy pills right you'd rather have a free clinic that people can come in drop their drugs get them tested and then they can know what they're actually going to take before they take them that's an amazing way to go about things so safety over everything um a article continues um uh, voice drone says um that he expect expect extended set times obscure back-to-backs and generally more expansive palette of sounds over the course of one event fellow co-founder seb glover hopes fold will be a haven for artists and fans alike we do strive so we strive to do things differently in london cultivating a more continental approach and creating a place where you can spend extended periods of uh extended periods or coming and going as you please our focus is creating a safe space that is disconnected from the intense pressures of london life that allows a freedom of expression positivity and inspiration which i think is flipping great right that's what you want key messages there i like the little thing what they're saying here about a more continental approach i guess because um I've read on the comments on this Resident Advisor article that a few, they've already launched, they've already had a couple of soft, uh, soft events, uh, soft, they've, they've already had, sorry, a, a soft launch at this Fold Club. Um, and most of them has kind of, uh, has been pointing the wall's direction of, um, what's that club night called? Um, into the woods or into the forest there's a few of them uh or keep 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 on going those kind of guys and um, they they're usually um foreign guys that are kind of not foreign but they're usually people from like italy spain uh french and shit who've uh, or france who've come to london recently who've kind of got a penchant for um underground culture and they've been the ones that have kind of been driving the whole like illegal forest raves um, um parties after 4 a.m until like maybe 10 a.m the next morning they've been putting them all around london and whatever so they they did the first kind of like soft launch there that was not wasn't really announced and they kind of do and they, and, they, and they've really done a really good thing because they're always promoting their friends and their friends have a very you know they have a very um diverse background of friends that they kind of are with maybe because you know the fact that they live together in a warehouse with different people and shit or the fact that they just come over with a few different people from everywhere which is going to be good because it's going to it's going to maybe um it's a different approach in lineups right because that's the kind of thing you kind of get a bit annoyed with sometimes when, with dawson shows it's just a bit stagnant right in terms of the sounds that you hear it's all kind of the samey sort of shit even even when it comes to like the basic hip-hop stuff right it's the same kind of djs playing the same sort of song it's not it's not there's no real or there's no real like um refreshing of sounds or of djs or personalities and a lot of that has to do with just the friendships people have right i'm not saying it's a bad thing but i think it's good to have like a place that you can go to that's going to have a completely different um programming than anything else that you've seen in london and i think that's gonna again it's a way to kind of you know um help it stand out from the crowd in general um and also whilst i like to point it out in there and the fact that you know disconnecting as well from the intense pressure of london i think it's a good idea too it's in the middle of nowhere literally um i've uh, trust me on this i lived in the area you're gonna go there and it's gonna be a great place to kind of like just disconnect it's kind of like when you make that long walk to the Bergheim. you know you've kind of you kind of all shut up you don't want to talk anymore because you read online that if you speak in the queue you might not get in you know that kind of idea it's gonna be fucking awesome to see all that stuff and you know i'm also happy about that all the little um all the all the um all the shops and and stuff around that area right because there's a mcdonald's that's open until late and that mcdonald's has kind of the only issue i have with it that mcdonald's has had a lot of trouble because there's a lot of kind of like um, um warring gangs around that area who kind of have a lot of fights in there and they've got you know it's just it, it gets a bit sticky but that's because the mcdonald's is open 24 hours they've got a 24-hour turkish shop no they've got 24-hour off license that's open down the road too um that's also going to have loads of business coming there i'm happy for all the all the little businesses around that are going to be able to kind of um make some money from all these hipsters going out and about and you know raving until the early hours in the morning it's going to be fucking awesome man it's gonna be some potential for entrepreneurs to make some real real good money um out there da, 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 da. what else i'm going to mention here let's carry on with this article in addition to the event space the complex has uh has has what gets up there has 
gets up on the screen. Um, in addition to its event space, the complex has, f- has five purpose-built 24-hour music studios, which will be available to hire by appointment of the Fold crew, according to today's announcement. Also in the works is the membership scheme, which will include access to other shaped collectives venues. Uh, Fold's first party set on Saturday, which I've already bought a ticket for, uh, joining the venue team. For opening night will be the likes of Revive Her, Make Me, Test Pressing, Dimensions, Ear to the Ground. Like all the fucking best promoters that we have in London. An exact lineup is still to be announced. Uh, the Fold team also says that the label showcase f- uh, for Ilian Tape, Clone and Pink Man are in the works. Um, you can see pictures of like the actual venue itself. And if you look, it's, it's basically an actual warehouse in the middle of nowhere. It's going to be incredible, man. I, I honestly cannot wait to, until this place opens. Um, I'm a little bit jealous, if I've got to be honest too. I'm a little bit pissed off, you know. As I mentioned, I think in the other podcast, it's always like this in London, right? The people that don't live here or are not from here are the ones that are the most creative and the most entrepreneurial and just just hit the ground running. They're the go-getters, right? I don't know how long some of these guys have even been in fucking London and they've already opened a 24-hour nightclub. In where, I, where I'm from, you know what I mean? It's fucking... Ugh. You know, people have ideas and you're just like, fuck, man. The amount of times I've chewed people's ears off, right, about the, about the lack of clubs nightclubs in london right about the lack of uh safe spaces in order to go and just party for 24 hours and 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 get fucked up right and just disconnect from everything right um i'm now in a great place where i'm kind of disconnecting from everything and like i mentioned before i'm not going to drink until uh, until the end of august i'm not doing anything i'm just working out i'm taking time to read i'm taking time to uh, write my blog to dj a lot and all these other things um yeah i mean but i do have my moments where i like to kind of like dip back in and go wild and then dip back out again and i think there's other people out there like that um who are like me too i know there's people that just get on it regardless but that's not for them i'm saying for people that don't get on it all the time and want to have somewhere to go party this is something that you need in london do you know what I mean you need someone to just go and disconnect just away from everything away from all the fucking pressures that someone's completely blacked out and just does a job i guess for the most part maybe places like print works kind of work that same sort of way but i haven't been there yet um but i'm just happy that somewhere like this that's local but again like i mentioned man i'm pissed off that i didn't have the fucking wearable to fucking think of this thing myself do you know what i mean but say la vie what can you do i'm happy that it's, it's there it's going to be running uh big up the whole shapes collective and the whole fold crew for putting the idea out there and putting their putting their uh, skin in the, uh, having some skin in the game as Nassim Taleb would say right having some fucking skin in the game they've actually put their money where their mouth is and they've opened up a venue that is the epitome of what it is to live in London and to live that kind of real on, kind of creative entrepreneurial dream right that journey you have to go through because everyone has ideas right you can go to bars all across London and speak to somebody that's got an idea about this I'm going to start this I'm going to start that but can you execute it and if, and if you can execute, can you execute it to a high level and do it well? And I'm sure this will kind of inspire the next batch of people to kind of think a bit outside the box. And hopefully, maybe it will inspire some other boroughs as well to kind of, you know, adopt this idea that, hey, there are these weird warehouse spaces that don't pay any rent. Imagine if it's a Hackney Council, right? You can maybe inc- you can maybe buy those buildings. You can maybe increase the rent so you make some profit off it. And then you can kind of get... in encourage club owners or promoters to kind of take over the spaces at a discounted rate for the first few months whatever and then that that can kind of maybe help the local economy you know um imagine breakfast places that are open those all those cafes right that are open that are filled up with builders or sometimes are completely empty um they will be happy with the with a business 24 hour offline will be happy with the business 24 hour fast food joints like kfc and burger king and pizza hut and other places they might even have places that are open pacific in those areas for extended hours because they know people are going to come out the clubs like everyone wins and especially if it's away from residential areas no one can no noise complaints it works for everyone so i'm happy i bought my ticket i cannot wait to fucking go man yes come on london it's it's about time it's about bloody time um what else um what's i've got in here to read about um you know what Uh, this is a bit sad but you know might as well mention it for the sake of mentioning it There was this weird, there was this video, right, um, that I remember seeing that I'm going to try and get up here or so you guys can kind of see and I'm going to kind of play it on YouTube as well. Let's see if I can find it. But it was a video that I saw um, with the one and only Jordan Peterson. I mean, Jordan Peterson on Bill Maher. And he asked a very, very interesting question that didn't get any traction, right? I mentioned that, I think, on social media. No one really gave him a response about it, but I thought it was an interesting question. And it, uh, and it kind of been, has been answered by this video. But let me play this and then you guys can be the judge of it. Let's see. Ba, ba, ba. Where is it? Da, da, da. Where is it? 
I never much liked Let's see. Here we go. One sec, one sec, one sec. Trump supporter. Okay, here we go. Let me get up on the screen. You guys can see. And if you listen for the podcast, I'm going to put my microphone next to the computer so you guys can see it. So this is interesting here. Let's take a look. Yes. I mean, I've been listening to yeah. all of this about Trump and watching how this conversations go in the U.S. And I have one question about it. I mean... There's all these people in the U.S. who are on the conservative side who are aligned with Trump for all sorts of reasons. And there's all this tension around his presidency and attempts to pull him out of his office for various reasons. And like, what, what do you think will happen if that comes to pass? What do you think will happen to these people that have identified with Trump? And, and like, how is it that, Repo- that, that Democratic types, for example, are holding out their hand to say to these conservative types, sort of like, welcome back into the fold? Because it looks to me, from an out, from an outsider's perspective, that, that your country is polarizing in a way that's not good, and that you know people are going after Trump. And I understand that. It's not like I don't understand that. But there's all these people that elected him and that are identified with him, and they're they're not taking this well, you know. And so, well, they're not. They're not. It's not. And you know, you might not think they're very bright and all of that, and and you know, they're backwards and 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 all of those things. But but you but you know. You need to have respect for the rest of your citizens, and if your if your country isn't going to pull itself apart, and I really see this happening from an outsider's perspective when I come. Now, so that was um, Jordan Peterson speaking um, on Bill Maher a few months ago, and I thought it was a very interesting question. I didn't really get any traction. They kind of skirted over the issue, right? Um, in the sense, it was interesting question being posed, you know, because you hear, because I, I don't really pay attention to the US politics thing. I try to, I, I kind of pl- I unplug myself, you know, everyone's always outraged or surprised by stuff that Trump does, even though he's shown you his hand, he's shown you the kind of guy he is, and they, they continue to be outraged about shit, right? Um, but it's interesting that there's this really, there's this strange campaign where they want to get him out of office, right? The people on the left who kind of don't like him, right? You kind of think he's a he's a he's a kind of social pariah or poli- or a political pariah, right? Or some or fraud or someone that's not looking after their best interests. So they want to get him out of office by any means necessary, whether it's the Stormy Daniels thing, the Russian collusion thing, whether it's um, him mentioning about voter ID, right? If this a funny video, Trump is like saying, "Oh, you need groceries. You need an ID even to buy groceries. You need an ID. You need an ID." No, you don't, mate. I mean, you know you're so rich, you have no idea what people need when they go to go buy groceries. You might need the groceries to go buy, you might need an idea when you go grocery shopping to get a SIM card, I think, nowadays, right? Or to get, like, a, a burner phone, right? Um, but anyway, they, they want to get him out, right, by any means necessary. But there's also this idea that I think, which is, um, which I'm kind of, wor- which I worry about with them in terms of the whole civil war thing, that not, not the Alex Jones way of it, but the kind of, you know, the whole US civil war, is that, you know, there's, Trump fans are very enthusiastic, right? Yeah, they're like, you know, they're like America, you know, USA, USA, wearing that Trump hat. They're very vocal, even though they're in, they might be in a minority, they might be, you know, ignorant, or whatever you might think of them, like Jordan Peterson said, but they're very, very vocal, right? And they get out there, they they, they go to the rallies, they, you know, they wear all the American flag propaganda shit. If you, if you, if you dispose of him or depose of him, um, in a way that isn't fair or in a way that's out in a way that's outside of a political race or a political election what do you think will happen right do you know what i mean like it's gonna be riots in the streets riot in the usa you know what i mean that is what it's gonna be and um there's evidence of that with this video that comes up next um this guy called jim acosta who's kind of been a bit annoying because he's the guy that's always shouting over questions to trump when he's um doing those speeches and shit um, when he doesn't get the answer he wants, he kind of like shouts, hey, hey, you know what I mean? He's always doing that kind of thing. And he's kind of turned himself into a weird kind of political analyst, activist sort of thing when he's when he's kind of being a bit, you know, he's kind of being a bit rude. Like, let the guy speak. You know what I mean, don't just shout your question. Um, let other people ask questions too. Don't just shout your questions and think you, you've got the right... Um, You've got the kind of the right to ask any um, any amount of questions that you want to ask, right? It's a little bit annoying in that respect, but this is an interesting video of him after a Trump rally, where I'm guessing he's just standing awaiting this crowd to leave before he can leave, and this is what the crowd are doing to him when he's there. Uh, I'll play this now.
So every all these Trump, all these rally, Jesus Christ, man, super middle finger. He got the big middle finger there from that lady. So basically, he's at this rally, and all these Trump voters that are at the rally are now leaving the arena. And as they walk past them, they're all kind of shouting, "You know, stop lying, stop lying!" All that you know, um, fake media shit. There's a guy wearing a fake media T-shirt. There's a woman that looks like Roseanne that's giving him the incredible long, long, long and pointy, aggressive middle finger. You know that kind of real one that's like really in your face. Um, she's giving him that, and there's tons of guys doing that kind of. Uh, that weird thing that people do now where when they get involved in a when they get involved in a fight or an argument with someone in public, they start recording shit. Do you know what I mean? It's like a weird I don't know what it is. It's like a weird personal CCTV. I don't know what that is. Like is that like a it's like a it's a really neaky, geeky thing to do, right? It's like the kind of like hall monitor, like uh, you're not on time. What did you say to me? It's really fucking annoying. Everyone keeps like shining their phone, and they've always got the bloody backlight on, right? Um, so he's getting absolutely, he's getting absolute pelters, right? And um, you know, he's maintaining composure and just recording all these people giving him the middle finger and shouting things at him. But he's also loving the fucking attention. But it's funny to see how team based it is, right? I heard Joe Rogan say it, um, a couple of times, but seeing this kind of video, you see how fucking teamy it is, right? Like America. Uh, Trump, they're like on, on that team, and then Jim Acosta's on like the media, free press, that kind of team. It's that's all it is. There's no dialogue happening. There's no like accountability on either side. On Jim Acosta's side, from shouting questions over the side, I mean, the back are like, hey, hey, Trump, Trump, right? And from th these guys, no accountability of like, you know, you're a grown adult, like, you know, maybe you shouldn't get be getting all your news from one station that is, you know, in the in the pocket of one political party uh maybe you should be maybe you shouldn't be you know pointing a middle finger at an adult <laughs> during a rally because you're on the groove his views it's just really bizarre in america the way things are going on um but this made me think of the of the of the thing that happened the other day um supposedly uh tommy robertson got released from prison isn't it? you know no the old, the old tommy robertson the old uh, edl fanboy um i'm pretty sure he's not in the edl anymore is he right um he got released from prison and i read an article that they had to shut down the entire prison to let him out because they were afraid of any sort of riots but i'm sure that happens most in most times right i'm sure when a prisoner gets released they have to shut down the prison right i'm pretty sure i don't think they have it open maybe not i don't know if you're a low risk maybe they'll let, allow you the everyone else to kind of stand outside and kind of give you a last hug before you go or stab you in the gut <laughs> before you leave but yeah tommy wrote him out and it kind of reminds me of the same sort of thing like that first Tommy Robinson rally, I'm pretty sure he's got conditions to his bail, right? He will probably want, he's probably not allowed to incite any kind of public um, disturbance or stuff. But that first Tommy Robinson rally is, rally is going to be fucking insane. Especially the way he kind of got shipped into prison straight away. Do you know what I mean? From recording that kind of... Um, what's that? The rape gangs outside the court. Or rec recording the court proceedings or standing outside the court. Uh, when, that, well, when the case was happening and then quickly being shipped off to prison, everyone kind of saw that as like, you know the government doing what they wanted but you know it's uh, when you listen to lawyers actually speaking about it it's it's kind of it's a normal way to go about things it's normal protocol and he'd, he'd been warned various times as well about his behavior and he still didn't listen but that first rally is going to be nuts because already there was other rallies with people doing the higher hitler sign they were fucking insane right when they were kind of doing those free tommy robinson rallies imagine now with him being out <sighs> Woo! so yeah i wish people would talk more but you know everyone wants to be in a team everyone wants to fight their own corner Talking about teams, you see what's happening with Man United, man. M Mourinho's kind of breaking down. He's cracking under the pressure or under the supposed pressure. Um, we've had probably one of the worst tours um, in the history of United tours, which is a you know, big thing to say considering most of our tours are an absolute diabolical shambles. Um, or if you believe what Mourinho's been saying. But it's a strange situation, really, isn't it? Um, it seems like he's having Mourinho first, se first season syndrome, right? Where he's kind of... Uh, he's kind of self-sabotaging himself in order to kind of get chucked out or to kind of get, you know, to kind of get fired. So um, I don't know what he's doing to kind of get sacked in general. I don't know if he doesn't want to be there. But ever since the M Madrid job, it kind of seemed like he's fallen out of love with football. And the theory goes that he went to Madrid, right? And he couldn't control a he couldn't control a dressing room full of actual winners, right? People who'd win, people who'd won stuff before he got there. Because every other club he went to before, he kind of empowered them uh, to be champions, right? He kind of turned them into warriors. Uh, Inter Milan had a kind of stagnant period before he got there. Uh, Chelsea were Chelsea, you know, per the perennial second and FA Cup winners. And also by the same token, uh, sporting, uh, I mean, FC Porto when he won the Champions League against, you know, against the odds kind of thing. 
he's always going into clubs and kind of, you know, um, empower the people there. But then when he went to Real Madrid, he kind of walked into a dressing room with actual winners who'd won stuff beforehand. And they, they weren't buying into his kind of us against the world, um, point, his way of motiva- motivating players. And I think the story goes, I think Sergio Ramos or a couple of players kind of pointed out to him that he actually, you know, that they didn't want to listen to him because he, had, he hadn't actually played the game. And, you know, and I think that is one of the... Um, that seems like one of the soft points or sensitive points in Mourinho's kind of armour. You know, it seems like it for the most part. Uh, he doesn't like that when I was kind of pointed out to him that he didn't actually play the game at a high level. And then, yeah, and it kind of deteriorated and he got kind of, you know, he kind of got told to get on his bike when he was at Madrid. And ever since then, he's kind of been a bit of a dour personality. And he's never been like that, right? He's always been a bit snarky, and but, a little, but very humorous. You know, he kind of didn't take this, anything too seriously, especially when it's in the media. But, you know, he kind of come across a bit grumpy, you know, didn't cut, he didn't shave his beard. He always had that kind of five o'clock shadow, just looked disinterested. And it's the same has happened with in uh, in United, and this tour has been an absolute disaster, man. He's he's been throwing little subs at Pogba when it when it kind of asked him about oh how how happy he is of how well he's done that um, with France with winning the World Cup and whether or not he'll be able to replicate the form. He kind of said something a little bit snarky about you know um, Pogba played great, but the World Cup is a perfect condition for someone like Pogba to succeed because you're away from all distractions and you don't have um, people in your ear and you're able to concentrate on football one hundred percent. It's like kind of you know insinuating maybe that he's not he's not playing well for United because he has distractions at home, bloody bloody blah. Then now he's saying he doesn't have enough signings. He got, he gave a list to the board for months ago of the players that he wants, and he still hasn't got the player that he wants. And he he's hopeful that he might get one, but he wanted five. And then you know he doesn't have the players in the squad that he wanted to have a good preseason with. He's just you know most of the players that are playing during the preseason aren't gonna play. He kind of threw the kids on the bus and saying they were shit. Like, loads of weird stuff that it doesn't really make any sense. You think if you're a player or if you're a young player or someone on the fringes, you'd kind of be a bit annoyed of what he said, you know? He kind of effectively said he kind of gave Damian the armband because he did, you know, as a gesture because he knows he wants to leave or he wants to kind of get him out of the club. Like, loads of strange things, man. But we're still going to start the season with Valencia right back, Chris Smalling in centre back and Phil Jones and actually young player left back. That's the real concern, right? And then we're going to have a midfield with Fred, Matic and Pogba, which I don't know how it's going to work. And then, I don't know, you know what I mean? Then we, we still got holes in our team. We still don't have an out and out winger. Uh, fullbacks are not very good. Um, yeah, we've got Martial. Um, the Martial incident, he flew He flew back to uh, Manchester before the Liverpool game because his fiance gave birth. Then he didn't fly back again. And he then made a tweet on Insta- on Twitter in French. Purposely didn't try. I don't think he said it in English either. Um, saying that, you know, family comes first. But, and that he's happy to go back to training tomorrow. And the story goes that he might be fined a couple of weeks' wages. It's just an absolute shit show, man. I, for one, um, would rather the Mourinho experiment kind of end now and we can kind of then go and look for a manager. But, you know, I don't know who we're going to get. But the the problem starts from the top of the club. You know, um, I heard LeBron James mention that he went, he, went, he, went, he went to go to the Lakers because, you know, it's one of the best franchises around, like uh, Manchester United, and started listing, over, listing, a list, uh, listing other franchises that he admired. And that's what we are. We're, we're, the mar- we're, the, we're the marquee of how to generate money if you're a football club, right? Um, um, a world name. You know, we could sell out arenas and tours all around the world and stuff playing football with no real big stars. Like the, club is, the club is bigger than any of our stars we have in our team, which is another thing that probably uh, is kind of unique to other football clubs. But in terms of actually the footballing side of it and the idea of winning trophies and how we're going to implement it and the change and the kind of player profiles we're going after. It doesn't make sense. So we're just like kind of buying players. There's no real methodology behind it. There's no footballing director. No one with a real footballing brain in there. It's an absolute shit show. So I think even with Mourinho goes, I'm, I'm hoping they don't just get another gun for hire in his place. I'm hoping they go for a footballing director to kind of really steer the club in a good direction. But unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen because the Glazers just want us to, if we're, as long as we've got Champions League football, they don't really care, which is annoying. But yeah, I'm not really looking forward to a new season. I think that the, the gap's going to be even bigger between first and second. Man City have improved them, have improved their squad with the addition of Riyad Mahrez. You know, Riyad Mahrez and Leroy Sane playing on either flank is going to be devastating. Um, yeah, it's just going to be nuts, man. Um, Unai Emre taking the helm at Arsenal, you know, actually turning him into an, a football club that can actually defend and attack is going to be fucking scary. Um, you've got Pochettino at Tottenham with another season under his belt, players more mature, maybe buying a few winners there to kind of sprinkle into the team. You've got Chelsea. 
with fucking Sari, that amazing football that he played at Napoli, uh, implementing that there at Chelsea with Jorginho or Jordino. It's gonna be an absolute shit show for United. We're gonna get. I think we, this is this is where this is the season where we're gonna see where the actual gap is between us and the top um, teams in Europe, especially with the Champions League and the league. We're gonna see the gap. One hundred percent. I wouldn't be surprised if we finish outside the top four. No, I'm surprised whatsoever. And I also wouldn't be surprised if Mourinho leaves before Christmas. But I'm hoping that doesn't happen. Hoping we know Rashford decides to have a thirty goal season and uh, and. Uh, uh, Andres Pierre Pierre decides to step up and become the new high matter, but you know, I doubt it's gonna happen. But yeah, it's gonna be tough times at United, man. Absolute diabolical time. What can you do? Anyway, it's a good time to put a pause on the podcast because I've got a jet off to work. This is the Action Zinger Show episode of episode number eighty nine with me, your host Agostino. A very short and concise one. Very happy about the twenty four hour nightclub in London. Woo woo woo. And yeah, there we go. We're ready to ready to roll. Um, what's happening this weekend? I think I'm DJing on Friday. I've got to double check and find out. I think so. Um, I think I'm DJing on Friday. Um, I tapped East in Westfield Stratford. So if you're in the area and you want to see me play some music, come down to Tap East in Stratford. It should be a good time. Play some songs, dance around, chill out. It'll be the first occasion that I can test my will and see whether or not I have the resilience and the willpower not to drink. That would be a good place to start. And um, what else is happening? That's about it, isn't it? I'm going to continue training. I've got Berlin trip happening up very soon. And everything else is looking on the up and up. This has been the Agazino Zinger Show episode number 89. As, as ever, this podcast is sponsored by Audible. So click that link below there and, and you know, buy a book on Audible. You'll get a 30-day um, free pass and you also get one free book credit. So support me so I can buy more books too audiobooks of course and also my patreon link there below you know help me out if you if you like what i'm saying you like you think i'm funny you think the stuff that i'm talking about is informative buy me a beer motherfuckers i'm not gonna buy equipment or give you any sort of um special limited edition content other people do buy me a beer allow me to get drunk and to get higher my friends this has been the Agostino Zinger Show episode number 89 with me, your host Agostino. Thank you so much for joining me. It's a nice sunny afternoon. I hope you guys have a lovely rest of the week weekend. I'm gonna see you guys again next week. Let's go, baby! Peace.